Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our special Brave Girls virtual story time of Martin and Anne with Anne's, uh, author Nancy Chernin and happy Women's History Month. My name is Emma and I'm going to be your host for today. A few housekeeping notes. Nancy will be answering questions at the end of her reading. You are welcome to ask your questions at any time during the program using the Q&A function on the toolbar. You may ask your questions at any time during the presentation, but they won't be answered until the end. And Nancy is so excited to have to answer your questions. I also want to let you know that this program is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing uh, through the National Women's History Museum's YouTube page uh, shortly after this presentation. And with that, I would love to introduce our author. Nancy Chernin is an award-winning children's book author who writes books about people who have made the world a better place and inspire children to be heroes and heroines too. She's written over 14 books. Our book today, Martin and Anne, has been translated into both Chinese and Braille. Born and raised in New York City, Nancy lives in the Dallas area. All her books come with free teacher guides, resources, and projects on her website, nancychernan.com. And with that, hello, Nancy. We are so excited to have you. Now you're still on mute. There you go. That, 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 that works much better, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and yes, yeah, so it has this book has been translated into Chinese, and here it is in Braille. I hold this up close. This is from the National Braille Press. It's such a beautiful job. Hold it up close so you can see all the bumps. There you go. Now I'm um, welcome all of you, and thank you so much, Emma. Thank you for the national to the National Women's History Museum for hosting me. It is my pleasure to share Martin and Anne today. This is a book very close to my heart. Um, I'm gonna, I wanna start off by showing you the cover of the book. The, uh, as you see, it's by Nancy Chernin. That means I wrote the words. It's illustrated by Yevgeny and Neighbor. And so I really want you to pay close attention to these beautiful illustrations by Yevgeny because an illustrator also tells his or her own story in the book, and Yevgeny certainly does that. Before I start, I want you to look at the cover. I want you to look at how different these two faces are. I mean, these two faces are different in about as many ways as we can think of differences. Am I right? So let me see. First of all, I know you're thinking back there, um, but I'm just going to speak for you. So all right, so one is male, one is female. We've got different genders here. We have different races. Um, we're gonna find out that they live in different countries. That means they speak different languages. Um, we're gonna find out that they have different religions. So my goodness, why would I even put two such different people in the same book? It looks as if they would not belong together, does it? So I'm gonna read you this book and then see if you can figure out why they might be or why they might belong in the same book. Are you ready for the story? Martin and Anne, the kindred spirits of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Anne Frank. In, and here is, um, yes, yes, there, there, we can come back to this because the dedication is also very personal to me. Um, in 1929, two babies were born on opposite sides of the ocean. They never met. They didn't even speak the same language, but their hearts beat with the same hope. I wonder what that was. On January 15th, Martin's father, mother, and older sister beamed at their beautiful baby in Atlanta, Georgia. On June 12th, Anne's father, mother, and older sister cooed at their beautiful baby in Frankfurt, Germany. Look at those beautiful babies. Oh, look at those beautiful families. But not everyone thought Martin and Anne were beautiful. When Martin was old enough to go to school, 
he had to go to a different one than his best friend because his skin was dark. Even worse, his friend stopped playing with him. Morton's skin hadn't changed, but suddenly his friend cared when he hadn't before. That made no sense. And when Anne was ready for school, Adolf Hitler, the leader of the Nazi party, was elected to lead Germany. Jewish children like Anne were no longer allowed in public schools. Anne's family fled Germany for Holland. But when Hitler invaded Holland, anti-Jewish laws followed. Anne's school closed its doors to her. Suddenly, her friends didn't want to play with her anymore. And can you imagine, how would you feel if you walked up to your school one day and the doors were closed and they said, no, you can't come in. We don't like the color of your skin. We don't like your religion. Any reason at all. And what if one day your friends didn't want to play with you anymore? How would that make you feel? And I want to show you something also about Yevgenia's illustrations. These two live in different worlds, right? Different sides of the world. And so you can see they're different worlds, but at the same time, they almost look as if they're looking in each other's directions because they know how each other is feeling. Next. Everywhere Martin went, he saw signs that said whites only. He wasn't welcome in public parks, swimming pools, or restaurants. Martin didn't think that was fair. Everywhere Anne went, she had to wear a yellow star of David that let people know she was Jewish. She couldn't buy ice cream or go to a movie. Every day more signs flared. No Jews allowed. Her father couldn't sell to non-Jewish customers. Nazis burn books by Jewish authors. So I think in the beginning they were sad, but now it, I think they almost look scared, don't they? Wow. How do you think those signs are making them feel? When Martin was 13, he won a speech competition talking about black and white children playing together in harmony. He wondered if the right words could one day change unfair laws. Words? What can words do? When Anne was 13, she got a diary for her birthday. She was happy she could share her most private thoughts with Kitty, the name she gave her journal. But soon after she began writing, Jews were rounded up and sent to death camps. Anne and her family hid in the attic over her father's business. They had to be very quiet. Because if anybody heard them, they could be arrested. Trapped in her attic, they couldn't go outside. Trapped in her attic, Anne described how beautiful the world outside was. How light could brighten the deepest darkness. And I want you to look on these pages. What is Martin holding in his hand? Paper with words. What is Anne doing? She's writing words on paper. Hmm. See. Martin finished high school at 15. Whoa, most colleges were for whites only. So he went to Morehouse College, a school for black students. There he learned about the Indian leader Mahatma Gandhi and how he won rights for his people using peaceful protests. Could the same thing work in America? Martin decided to become a minister who would lead his people to stand up for justice. And hidden in the attic, continued her studies as best she could. And every day she wrote in her diary about her dreams for a better world. Even with all the hate around her, Anne believed that people were really good at heart. And again, look at the paper in Martin's hand, paper filled with words. Look at the paper in Anne's hand that she's filling with words. When Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her bus seat to a white man, Martin, now a minister, organized protest marches. He gave speeches. He told people not to ride the buses until everyone was treated fairly. Now, I want you to think about it. What are speeches made up of? 
Words. What are these signs made up of? Words. Martin shared his dream of a world where all were truly considered equal. His words gave people courage and strength. Huh. While Martin grew older, Anne's 15th year was her last. Oh, I always, I hate writing that part because I wish that, the, that, the, that it all worked out differently. But the, the, her 15th year was her last. The Nazis stormed Anne's hiding place. They arrested her family and the friends hiding with them. Anne's diary was left behind, pages scattering on the floor of the dusty attic. But remember, I told you, here are the words and they look, they look like they're gone forever. But she still believed in the power of simple acts of kindness. And you're going to learn about somebody who did do a kind thing to save these words. And I want to take one minute looking at Yevgenia's illustration here and how remarkable it is. I want to ask you how it makes you feel. I want you to think about that because we're not seeing Anne in this picture. We're not seeing her family and friends. We're not seeing the Nazis. We're not seeing all the ugly things they did. What are we seeing? We are seeing giant storm clouds here. We're seeing a lightning bolt. We're seeing how the house looks so small compared to that storm. Do you ever feel small in the world? Like everything seems so big and dark and scary. And maybe you feel small and maybe not steady on your feet like maybe slightly askew like that house. Yevgenia with her drawings, she's sharing feelings. You can do that with art. You can share how you feel just as you can with words. So Anne still believes in the power of simple acts of kindness. Okay, let's see what happens next. Martin won the Nobel Peace Prize when he was 35. Oh, that is amazing. He worked with President Lyndon Johnson to help pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964. At last, those ugly whites only signs were against the law. And let me ask you something about laws. What are laws made up of? Words. So think about that. Words, something you can't touch, taste. Feel, where words really have the power to change our lives, don't they? Okay, this next part I also hate reading because I wish this, did, this wasn't true, but only a few weeks before the concentration camp was liberated and died along with her older sister. But here is the simple act of kindness I was telling you about. She would have been amazed at her diary rescued by a family friend, a family friend who wished she could have saved Anne, but she couldn't save Anne, but she did save the diary. And she gave those pages to Anne's father. She, and those pages became a bestseller. Her father, the only one in her family to survive the camps, had her book published. Actors performed her words on stage and film. You can see the diary of Anne Frank on the big screen, sometimes on stages. The cramped rooms where she hid became a museum in Amsterdam dedicated to speaking out against hate. The Anne Frank House in Amsterdam has this book, Martin and Anne, in their library. And they are always speak up against hate whenever they see it. Oh, I hate reading this part too, forgive me. But when Martin was 39, he was shot and killed by a man who didn't believe black people deserve the same rights as white people. But you know what? No one could kill the way Martin inspired others. Just as Anne's words will never die. We are still reading their words, Martin's words and Anne's words. 
Martin and Anne were born in different places, but they both dreamed that one day all babies would be seen as beautiful, as all babies are, as each and every one of you listening to this story is, as all babies are, as all people. Love is stronger than hate. Kindness can heal the world. Thank you so much for letting me share this story of my heart with you. Um, I wrote this because I truly do believe that kindness that love is stronger than hate and kindness can heal the world. And I hope you're thinking about why then I did put these two. They look so different at the beginning. Do they still seem different to you here at the end of the story? I'd love to know what you think. Thank you so much, Nancy, for reading that and sharing that powerful story with us. Um, I know I was moved by the power of words, and I hope our audience was as well. So Nancy is happy and available to answer your questions. You can put them in the Q&A, and we already have a few questions for you, Nancy. Um, so the first one um is how long did it take you to write the book oh that is an excellent question you know i have i have many books and they each take you know a different amount of time so these are these are my books and you can see them behind me as well this was actually one of my faster books it took me a matter of months and i think because i was so on fire to write it um, what I was seeing in the world when I, when this came to me was a rise in hate crimes, which was upsetting me so much because I, I was really hoping the world was going forward and becoming a kinder and more just place. And I was seeing more and more hate crimes and I was getting discouraged. And what I do when I'm discouraged is I look for the people who inspire me, people who didn't lose faith. And then I immediately thought of Dr. King Boy, did Dr. King live in easy times? They threw everything at him, didn't they? And did he ever give up? No, until the, the very last moment of his life, he was standing up for justice and, and, and believing that even if he didn't get there personally, we would get there as people. And Anne Frank in her diary, living through the Holocaust, did she have an easy time of it? It was horrible what was going on and she never lost faith. So I thought if these two great people don't lose faith, I can't. And then when I went and I read about them to read their words and realized they were born in the same year, it just came upon me that I had to write their parallel story. And I started writing about what was happening to them at the same times in their lives. And I was just on fire with this. I was also very fortunate because um, one of uh, Marissa Moss, I shared this with her. She is a wonderful editor and the publisher of Preston Books. And she felt this book needed to be in the world. And so pretty soon uh, we were just going back and forth. And it was seriously, it was a matter of months. It was one of my faster books. I, I felt that it felt I just needed to be there. And it just went through me like a fire. Thank you for sharing that story, Nancy. Um, I'm going to combine a bunch of questions that came in. We have a number of audience members who want to know how many other books you have written and uh, what their titles are. Oh, well, thank you so much for asking. Well, I have, I have a lot. Um, so I have, let's see, I have a, a 16 books out right now and two more coming out. Um and, and I've been actually, if you go to the National Women's History Museum uh, archives, you will see that I have shared a few of the books here with all of you, including um, A Queen to the Rescue, right? The story of Henrietta Zolt, founder of Hadassah, and Dear Mr. Dickens, right? Um, about a brave woman who spoke up to Charles Dickens 
Um, Charles Dickens is a great writer, um, but even he had moments where he did not always do the right thing. He indulged in ugly stereotypes. And Eliza Davis said, you know what? I admire you. You're great, but this is not good. You can do better. And because of her letter, he did do better. Um, and became an advocate um, rather than uh, somebody who indulged in ugly stereotypes. So I, I don't know if you want me to really read all of them because there are a lot. The William Hoy story is about the great deaf baseball player, William Hoy. Manji moves a mountain about a man who moved a 300 foot chisel, a, a path through a 300 foot mountain to help the kids in his poor village get to school on the other side. Maybe you want to hear about the women. Um, but I don't know, I can just show this to you and you can look up nancychernan.com and learn about all of these. Uh, I only write about people who inspire me, who I hope will inspire you, people I think you might not know about otherwise. Martin and Ann are probably two of the most famous people I've written about, but I felt they'd never been written about in this way, where we discussed their parallels, where we discussed about how um, discrimination follows a playbook where you see the same pattern, segregation, discrimination, and then the ugly things that follow. So, but all of my other books, a lot of them are the first picture books about these people. Yes, and I did put a link to Nancy's website in the chat. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about any of her books, including Martin and Anne, as well as uh, links to teacher resources for all of the books, I would encourage you to check out Nancy's website, which is again in the chat. All right, so we have a couple more questions that I'm going to combine, um, which is, when did you start writing these books? How old were you when your first book came out? Oh, okay, uh, okay, it's another great question. And I had to tell you, I would, before I answer that, I have to tell you, my mother's a retired teacher and I would never dare put a book out in the world without a teacher's guide and resources. Um, so uh, you're asking me when I started uh, the very first. So uh, it, what's, what's funny is, that, uh, the reason I always laugh when people ask me that is because um, my sister dug up uh, a, a book that I had written and illustrated myself when I was a kid. It was called D is for Doodlebug or I, or a boy called Doodlebug and other names. And I wrote and illustrated it myself a, a, with paper that I had swiped off my dad's desk. Of course, that's not my pub, that's not a published book, but it's always fun to share on my author's journey. But my first published book was the William Hoy story in 2016. And the way that came about is I was I've been a I always dreamed of writing children's books, um, but I put that aside to become a journalist and later a theater critic. So I was working as a journalist and covering theater for the um, first for the Los Angeles Times, later for the Dallas Morning News. And there was a high school in Garland, Texas, who had a play about this deaf baseball player, William Hoy, and I was just fascinated by it. Um, and it turns out that this deaf baseball player was born when Abraham Lincoln was president. Um, they said, William, you can't play. You're deaf. You can't hear the umpire's calls. He teaches the umpires his language, sign language. Do you know the sign for safe and out? That's American Sign Language. I know. I know. Thank you, William Hoy. So I wrote the article. It ran. I get a thank you note from a man named Steve Sandy in Columbus, Ohio. Now, remember, I'm in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> this is from Columbus, Ohio. I'm saying, well, I'm really glad you like this story about a, a high school play in Garland, Texas. Um, but I'm just, I'm surprised you wrote to me and he explained he was deaf. It's his dream to get Hoy in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. In short, this became my mission. Most people did not know who Hoy was. I knew it would make my friend Steve Sandy, who was deaf, um, happy to have such a book in the world so more kids would know. And my idea was, I'll write the book. And then kids will write letters to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. We will get them in there. And um, I made that promise in 2003. The book came out in 2016. It's my first book. Who's doing the math? 16 minus 3. 13 years. It took me that long to figure out how to write a picture book. 
<laughs> because I was a I was a professional journalist. I could write articles in 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half was also already a long time for me to take with a story. And I didn't realize that a picture book was very different from a newspaper article. But eventually I learned. And then once I did that, I was just off and running because I went, William Hoy was such a joy to write. Um there must be other people out there who do not have their stories told, people who made a positive difference in the world, people who healed the world, people who can encourage us to heal the world as well. And that became my mission. It still is. That's amazing. And with opening day, baseball opening day next week, if anyone is interested, William Hoy's story might be a great way to kick off the season. And it's Deaf History Month, March 15th through April 15th. So you've got both in one. Perfect. All right. So questions are coming in very fast. Um, and again, I'm going to try to combine some of these questions. Where do you get inspiration for your books? Do you ever look at other books for inspiration? Oh, that's that's very interesting question. Yes. I mean, sometimes, um, hmm. I think I just always have a radar out looking for those people who don't have their stories told. Again, I'm not eager to write the umpteenth story about somebody whose story is already covered. If that person's story has been covered and covered well, I'm going, great. I am so glad it's in the world. I don't need to do that. I'm looking to do the ones that haven't been covered. Um, but every once in a while, I'll find out about somebody. Like, for instance, I was like just curious. Very often, a lot of what drives me is curiosity. So I wondered, well, who was the first black golfer on, on the PGA Tour? And I found out it was Charlie Sipper. And it was like, who is Charlie Sipper? And I found out there was an autobiography. So I did read his autobiography and try to learn more about him. And that eventually became the first and only picture book about Charlie, which is Charlie Takes a Shot. Um, by the way, for any of you who are golfing fans, Tiger Woods named his son Charlie for Charlie Sipper. Jackie Robinson makes an appearance in the book because Charlie wanted to do for golf what his friend um, Jackie did for baseball. And also a man named Charlie Mosk, who was not a golfer, but a lawyer and just wanted to help. Um, and actually, there's a new book, adult book out right now about um, Stanley Mosk and, uh, and Charlie Sifford and how together they changed golf for the better, opening up to everybody. But sometimes, like, for instance... Beautiful Shades of Brown. And by the way, uh, I think that's another book. Didn't I read that for the National Women's History Museum? Beautiful Shades of Brown is the only picture book about Laura Wheeler Waring, whose work right now is being featured at the Metropolitan, um, at part of the Harlem Renaissance, and also um, at the Brooklyn Museum, um, at uh, the Smithsonian, uh, has her artwork in Washington, DC, the National Portrait Gallery. How did I find out about her? I saw a beautiful painting of Marian Anderson, which is, I think, part of the collection. And I went, who painted this? And then I just had to know more about Laura Willow Waring. There weren't any books about her. I had to, I had to put on my journalist hat, become a detective, went to the Smithsonian, talked to the curators there, got the information. They put me in touch with, uh, with one of her descendants, Madeline Murphy Rabb. So I talked with the family and I had to do all my research through the museum, through the family um, and through studying the paintings everywhere I could. So sometimes there are books available, Irving Berlin, lots of books available, um, but, uh, but some people, there are next to none. I am looking at newspaper articles. I am looking at interviews with descendants or experts. I go where I need to go to get what I need to get to share the story with you. Well, thank you for that. So we have time for, for, I think, four more questions. And some of them are about you, Nancy, but one is about Martin and Anne. We had a couple of our attendees ask, is the story real? Yes, this is nonfiction. Um, everything is verified. This is a true story of Martin, a true story of Anne. Um, and again, they never met, right? So I'm just sharing the parallel stories. I will tell you that the um, the Anne Frank Center for Mutual Respect in New York City, I had a wonderful opportunity to co-present with them at the New York City School Librarians Conference. 
they created a play called Letters from Anne and Martin, which is wonderful. And it is also nonfiction because every word in that play are words from Anne's diary. So her actual diary and Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail. And uh, so everything there is, is verified. And, and by the way, especially for uh, the older students, if you ever get a chance to see that play or bring that play to your school, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and I was so moved when I saw that play, I actually, I cried because there is one, the, the two actors are separate. There's only one moment they have Martin turn to Anne and it's when he's reading the lines. And again, this is from his own letter that had he lived in Hitler's Germany, he would have helped his Jewish brothers. And I'm gonna add on sisters, but he wrote in Jewish brothers. And I always like to say, well, what did he mean by that? He was a Baptist minister. How did he have Jewish brothers? But again, we've talked about this. We're one human family, aren't we? And we're all here to look out for each other. And that's what he understood. And that's what, that's really what this book is about. We have to all look out for each other, the vulnerable among us. But yes, every of the story is true. Both stories are true. Thank you so much, Nancy. And yeah, I think what you just said is so important. We have to look out for each other because we're all part of one human family. So uh, to wrap up, there are so many great questions. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I do wanna to get to these final few. Um, we had a number of attendees ask, what is your favorite book, Nancy? Could be of that you've written, or if you don't wanna pick favorites, your favorite book, the, the book that inspired you the most. Oh my goodness. Those are two very, very hard questions. And, and people love to ask those questions. I love to, you know, I, I always say about regarding my books, um, I only write about people I love. And I am actually a mother myself. And if you said, well, which is your favorite child? I couldn't tell you because they're all my children. And these are all my book babies. So I love them all in different ways. And and what I just hope for them all is when, whenever you take one of these home with you or um, read them or have them read to you, I feel like you're having a play date with one of my kids. And I hope you're having a great play date and that you're a good friend to them and they're a good friend to you. And as far as like what books were most important to me, um, there are just so many because I am I am an omnivorous reader. I read everything. I can tell you the very first book that my mother ever read to me, I, as I told you, my mother's a retired teacher, was The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And you're going, what? And it was like my first favorite. I have so many favorites since because um, any book that opens up a world and moves one's heart and helps you live another life, see life through somebody else's eyes, to me is a wonderful book. I guess in The Wizard of Oz, I'll just never forget that moment where Dorothy opens that door and she's in Oz. And I have to tell you, that's how I feel when I'm, when I'm entering a book as a writer or I'm entering a book as a reader. Um, I, I'm looking for that moment where I'm opening the door and I'm in Oz. I'm in a new place. I'm in a place I've never been before. I, I'm seeing things. I'm seeing colors. I'm seeing I, ideas. I'm feeling things. I'm knowing things. And to me, that's a great book. And those great books are here among us now. And they are yet to come. Um, you know, I always love that. Like, I, you know, I always like to think, you know what? I might have loved Wizard of Oz. But you know what? People who lived in the 1800s, they never experienced that book. There was a world before that. And there was a world before my books and world before other books. And each of those books, they changed the world somehow. Right now, you probably can't imagine a world without The Wizard of Oz. But yeah, there was one for a very long time. And you know, maybe the world is waiting for your stories and for you to change the world for the better through the stories you share with, with us. Well, that is actually a great transition to our final two questions. So the first one is many people want to know, what are you writing right now? What is your next book? And then I'll ask you our final question. Well, I actually have, um, I have, oh, I have book two, I have a couple of books that haven't been announced yet. So I, I don't feel I can announce them because they're waiting for illustrators before they're announced, but I'm very excited about them. And again, 
Um, these are stories close to my heart. I can tell you that, and one of them actually is going to be my first bilingual book. It's going to have English and Spanish on every page. And I co-authored it with a dear friend who shared her experience um, making a difference, standing up for justice at her school. Um, so I, I can't tell you anything more about that. I can tell you about the ones that are about to come out. Um, Rainbow Allies, the true story of kids who stood against hate is coming out in July. This is also a true story um, about um, a couple living together in Natick, Massachusetts, a married couple. They come home one day, they find out their pride flag is torn down, their house has been egged. The children are distraught to see how upset this couple is. They try to find a way to make them feel better and they find a very beautiful way. A very beautiful way. I don't know if you want me to tell you the way they found, but they do find we'll leave, we'll leave that for the actual book, just and to then, know what the, the story is. And then coming early next year is a teddy bear for Emily and, and President Roosevelt too. And this is a true story of an immigrant Jewish family in Brooklyn who wanted to thank a kind president, Roosevelt, by making him, he saved a bear and they, they created what they call Teddy's bear, Teddy apostrophe S bear. In, um, and this was in 1903. And my goodness, um, that bear kind of took off, didn't it? Teddy bear is pretty popular today, but it was, but I wanted you to know that this bear was founded out of kindness. It was a thank you to a kind president. And I think kids took that teddy bear to their hearts because it symbolized kindness. Well, I'm very excited for those books. And for our final question, uh, given that what we've been talking about is the power of words, mm -hmm. one of our attendees wants to know if students want to be an author, what steps should they take? How can they start working towards that dream, particularly in the lower elementary grades? Oh, I, that is such a great question. Um, you know, uh, I want to tell you that one, one of the, um, I'm going to be on a panel at the Texas Library Association, and it's about this wonderful young authors program I've been involved with, uh, with the Richardson Public Library here in Texas. And if there are any teachers here who want to know more about the Young Authors Program, it is a fabulous program and the librarians here are very generous in sharing their expertise and knowledge. And it's an eight week program um, where kids learn how to create a picture book from you know, creating the, the, the dummy where you plot it out to me sharing the whole quest, you know, how every book starts with somebody's dream a dream that may seem unattainable, but you persevere, you face obstacles, and ultimately when you achieve that, when your main character achieves that dream, they share the goodness of that with their community. And most books follow that pattern. So I teach in that program, the librarians help in that program. And at the end of that program, they print two books for each child, one to keep in the library, which it can be checked out it's an actual library book and the other to take home it's a wonderful program again it's called young authors richardson public library i am so happy to share those contacts and resources with you i will be presenting at the texas library association kids keep writing that's what i did keep writing keep a journal keep writing if you can encourage your school to start a young authors program um, maybe it can be within the classroom part of your english writing exercises Maybe it's an after-school program. Maybe you have a little critique group where you and friends share your stories, help each other improve them. Even as, a, you know, where I am, I am part of groups because I would like to assure you that even though I have all these books, none of them pop out of my computer or off my page ready, ready to go. I share them with my friends, my critique partners, um, ultimately, when they're acquired by editors, we're going back and forth, just as you do with your teachers. Don't ever get discouraged because things don't come out right. Nothing comes out right. You have an idea in your head, and what happens on the page is usually a big disconnect. And what makes it get closer and closer to what you envision 
is the work. It's the rewriting, the revisions. Rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. Don't give up. Anything worth achieving is worth working on. And you never fail until you give up. As long as you keep going, it's just a question of how long it takes you to succeed. Remember, I told you about that very first book. I made that promise to my friend Steve Sandy in 2003. It came out in 2016. I didn't fail. It just took me 13 years to succeed, to keep my promise. Keep your promise to yourself and you will make it come true. I think that is a wonderful message to leave for our budding young authors. Just keep writing your, your words in particular matter. Don't erase, just keep trying. Um, I also want to say how many people wrote into the Q&A, Nancy, just to say how much they loved the book and they loved today's program. And I want to echo that. It was wonderful to have you. It was wonderful to hear the story of Martin and Anne, which is such an important story for us to remember, particularly during Women's History Month. Be kind and to just recognize each other as all part of one human family. So I want to thank our audience again for being so open with their questions and so excited to participate. And Nancy, I want to thank you for, again, this wonderful story and being so open uh, with your answers and inspiring our young audience. So to everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and happy spring, happy Women's History Month. We hope to see you again soon. Bye, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, National Women's History Museum. Your work is so important. I am so happy to support your mission. Bye, everyone. Bye.